Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Good evening. Right, don't ask. Now, this will either go really, really well or it will go very badly wrong. Can you put them on the floor for me, James? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's just the little, little ones that are out tonight. Is that right? Okay. Um, it's amazing what's happened so far. It really is fascinating how we, we, we genuinely don't coordinate the songs and Beth Slot and all of those things. People just bring what they feel they need to bring. And it's incredible. Not surprising, really, if we believe that there is a a power at work to sort of communicate what we need to hear. But so much of what has been said and done tonight really fits with what I want to share with you. If you were not here last week, um, Ant talked about purpose. And the newsletter that Jenny mentioned is really good if you miss a Saturday or you can't quite remember what was said when you go back to the business of life for just doing a summary of what was spoken about. So that would be a good place for you to visit. And everything that we say and do is always on the website to replay. But I was really, um, I really enjoyed hearing it again because I have heard him talk about those things. You know, there's always things added on before. Um, but it so, so struck me again how this is such an issue in my life, in our life, and it was really good to visit it because we all have a motivator in life um, that gives us our why, our reason for being. And we have all sorts of things that drive us. I mean, some of the things I wrote down here is some of us, we live to... We, we live to feel good, to look after others, to survive, to be seen, to be heard. We want to change. Um, we, want to, we have all these whys of why we do things. And some of them, you've got the good, the bad, the ugly mixed in there, haven't you, sometimes? You've got the whys you think you're living and the whys you're actually really living, if you were to really call it and be honest and have that level of self-awareness. Um, but I do believe that there is a, a, a God-given purpose that exists within each one of us. And I just want to show you something tonight that some of you will have seen before, some of you won't, because I think it's really important to revisit it. Now, on my next slide, it basically says this, do not be, do not, sorry, be not deceived with the first appearance of things, for show is not substance. And the question I've put next to that is, I think, really key. What if my perception of the purpose of my life is not the purpose of my life at all? What if what I think is my driver turns out to be something really quite different? And what if there's much more to my story? And because I believe, I mean, that, that, that video, I found the, the music really moving. I found that video really moving. I found the pictures from Goa really moving. Because so much of what drives us is a feeling that we are not full. Somehow a feeling of lack because we just want to be full in life. And so much of what can be our motivator under the surface and what's driving us is just that desire to have a complete and satisfied life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that desire because it says that we're called to have life and life in all its fullness. But where we find what fills us can become a problem. Now, I want to just share with you one brief Bible story that, again, sprung to mind this week. And um, I want you to be thinking about what it might have to say about purpose. So it'll come up on the screen, and I, my, my notes are too small to read, so I'll stand over here and read it. Um, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your minds and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. 
a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, if you, um, I looked for some pictures of this story. There's some real quite comedy ones. But if you put up the first one for me. Now, this is someone's illustration of the story. You might not to be able to read the writing from where you are, but the person who sort of turned this into a storyboard um, has clearly got the man along the pathway, he's walked, he's beaten up, and then the three people walk on by, and then the last one takes him to this, I'm not sure there was wheelchairs and the room looked like that in the original story, there was a great one where one of the guys walking on by was on one leg, hopping, so we clearly hopped on by in that version. Now this, in this part of the story, I thought it very much becomes about why we go where we go, why we do what we do, and how we interact with people on our path. I'm sure they all had somewhere very important and pressing to be in their very busy schedule, but actually Jesus highlights the fact that, hang on a minute, what was important, most important, went undone. Now, if you look, to, look at the next one, this was done very differently. The person who had interpreted this story, and can't we all bring our own interpretations to things, had very much included the fact that there was the conversation with Jesus before the story. And for me, if we only dwell on what happened with the Samaritan and don't look at what the exchange was between Jesus and the teacher of the law, we kind of miss the point of the story. Because if you go back up to that passage, Robert, for me, please, two slides up. Why was the man asking the question? It said that he stood up to test Jesus. There was a motivator in his heart that he's wanting to work out what's really going on here and suss this guy out. And it also says later on, verse 29, that he wanted to justify himself. And the story that Jesus used was his response because he was challenging something deep down in the man's core because what the version of life that the man had come up with allowed him to have all of these wonderful laws and things in place, but enabled him to be like the guys who walked on by and not really fully grasp the, the big picture that was required, and that was to have mercy. And he was very much driving at that, per, that point. He was exposing the man's judgment as a result of his duty to the law. Now, last week, Anth talked about the process, that when we have purpose, it produces passion, it produces joy, it brings us to release. But if we have tasks and duties to fulfill, it's going to produce resentment and it ultimately is going to lead to judgment. And that's what he was driving at in his heart. He wanted it to be about love. Now, I'm going to show you this. I hope it's going to work. And I very much felt I should do this today. Um, the kids were around at my house last night cooking. And Ethan, out of nowhere, just mentioned this. I can't even remember why or what context, but <laughs> thanks, you gave me my preach. So, now, you will have seen this. Everyone's seen the Big Rocks principle. Has everyone seen the principle of the Big Rocks? Who's seen this before? Oh, that's not all of you. I'm really pleased. This will be new to some of you. I was going to show it you on a video, but I thought this would be more fun because something will go wrong, won't it? And then you can all laugh. Right. Now, the principle of the Big Rocks is this, right? In, that represents your life. It's see-through, so you can see what I'm doing, okay? Now, in life, we have all sorts of things that we put into our life, yes? Now, the idea is big rocks. This isn't going to translate very well on the audio, is it? I am now putting the big rocks into the jar. <laughs> it's for the people listening, right? So the big rocks are going to go, and you put the big rocks in of your life, and you're going to fill up your life with the big stuff, okay? Now, is that jar full? Please comply and pretend it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, then what we can do, I'm adding smaller gravel. This is going to go wrong. No, what happens? There might be big rocks, but there's still room. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Ethan, I blame you. 
look how much room there is. Your big rocks are in first. Look, there we go. I'll tidy up after, I promise. Are you getting the idea? Are we getting the idea or I have to keep doing this, right? Now, imagine that's full. Is there any more room? You're not very compliant, are you? Right, okay. Just bear with. Bear with who watches Miranda. Bear with. Bear with. <laughs> now, sand. Teeny tiny little things. But look. Look how much you can fit in. Look. Now, this is supposed to represent a, la a life that has great depth and great contrast and a life of substance. Can you see that this is a substantial life? It is a little bit messy. It's not perfect, is it? But within there, there's a lot going on. Get it? Right. Now, this is the other side. So that one is, the, I know the jar, I know they're not the same size, and yes, it does upset me, but we'll live. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm getting over it, look. I thought this, will, this is my challenge to myself, these not being the same size. Now look, what happens if you start without the big things in place in your life and you just make life about what so-and-so said, all the voices, all the stuff I've got to do, all the jobs, all the shopping, all how you feel, all what you see. Right, what happens then if you want to try and put some big stuff in your life? There's no room. Thank you. Very much correct answer. I know I've not done this perfectly. The people on the internet take 10 minutes. But do you get very visually the principle of what I'm trying to show you? And I think we all end up often, more often than we probably mean to, like this. I'll tell you why. How often does life just become about stuff? And I listened to Ant preach on purpose last week. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. I agree. <laughs> and then you live your week. Um, yesterday, my day consisted of, um, we got up, the boys went to work and to school. They both went to school because you work at school. So they both went to school. My mum had been stopping overnight because she'd been visiting because my dad was away. My mum came in the morning for ha half eight for breakfast and... Um, Someone in a church congregation had just sadly passed away. This l lovely 90-year-old um, lady who was a good friend of my mum, so my mum was really sad. My emails were pinging because there was a thing kicking off at work that I had to sort of troubleshoot and fix. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, should I listen to my mum because my mum's upset, or should I answer the emails, or should I answer the phone call that's coming? Um, then I needed to go and see somebody and help them with something, and then I'd arrange to see somebody else for lunch. All these things I wanted to do. I had a big deadline that's due next week, so I knew I had work to do, then I had people around for tea, then I had the kids come in with lots of stuff because we were going to cook, and then going was going out, and all this, and there was nothing negative about any of those things that I wanted to do, but can you, my day just became this kind of, oh, oh, don't know what to do, don't know what to do, don't know where to be, and I had a wonderful, wonderful day, but how often does that then become about all of that? And all it becomes about is by the end of the day, you're almost a bit like, I don't know where I am, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know, I don't know. You're almost a little bit overwhelmed. And what you realise is somehow or other, your life has just been very, very full all day. But you probably haven't really fully been present for any of it because you've actually been thinking about the thing you've got to do after the thing you were already doing. Who recognises that? Please tell, you, tell me that's not just me. Now, what happens... Is the big stuff in our life about me deciding which of those things is more important? So was my mum more important than my job, or my friend, or those kids last night? Which of those things are more important? The, you can't answer that question, so the big rocks can't be the stuff. It just can't be the stuff, because in one moment, that's going to be more important. In the next moment, that will be more important, because it's got to be about what is most most the now thing that is in front of you. So for me, 
what I was reflecting on today is that the big thing in life is about that connectedness and is about that presence in any given moment. And what I managed to do for most of the day yesterday was to be present in the moment I was in and enjoy it for what it was and try and box off what was I knew was round the corner but was not imminent. Now, I've totally lost my place. This is the thing. The trick, my presence for me is the big rocks, and that is the challenge, to not let the gravel and the sand of the task stop me being fully present in each one of those moments so that each thing gets me. To accept that some of these things may not have happened perfectly, but to live in the tension of what is my responsibility and what is not. Now, interestingly, I was got in my car yesterday, plugged in my headphones, and the bit of a book that was playing automatically was from Rob Bell's Velvet Elvis. And what he was talking about was the moment where there was a debate. In Acts 15, there's a debate, a debate between the apostles and the elders about all sorts of things that were going on and what should be done about it and what should be done about the law and these Gentiles who were coming in, don't follow our rules, and what should we do? And there was this line where he basically says in the Bible, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And this was Rob Bell's response, and I thought it was brilliant. They are making a monumental decision in the course of Christian history. They don't claim to have the absolute word from God on the matter. They at best claim guidance, but even that they hold loosely. They make a decision, they step up, they take their responsibility seriously. They acknowledge a sense of God's leading, but they remain humble. With their seams, they leave room to admit that they may not have nailed it perfectly first time. They hold their action and God's action in healthy tension. They understand they have action to take, but they also understand that God is at work as well. They don't take a passive route, which is to do nothing and to assume that God will miraculously do it all. And they don't take a route based in human arrogance, which leaves no room for the leading and guidance of the Spirit of God. What if we to, were to say that what we do, about what we do, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us? There is a sense of movement in the words from the early church. They are discovering things and making decisions, but the inherent assumption is that they are on a journey. There's more ahead, and God is with them every step of the way. They aren't done yet. I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. Because which bit in all of this is my bit? And which bit am I not responsible for? And that can be the tension. Now, we are very much learning. And I remember that line today that says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it occurred to me that in all this wrestling we do between what, you know, what am I supposed to do and what am I supposed to do? We have heard a lot in this place. If the very essence of Christ in us is in us, in any given moment in my day, I have the power to be creating and to be living and to be breathing and to be the presence of God on earth. And how can I be that if all I am focused on is my stuff? Now, I'm going to make this very simple. If you have got to the point in life where all you see is the stuff and you don't feel fulfilled in your life, and that's you, what's your only option? How is that going to feel? Now, some of you have reached a point, and I know you have, some of you reached a point where that was your life, and you know something's missing, and something's not right, and somehow or other, the big fundamentals are not in place. And then you're either keeping all your stuff to give you the illusion of it still feeling full, or you're in a process where you're realizing you've got to empty. And what I want to sort of show you visually is that that's actually a good idea. That is a good idea. And we've just heard and sung about beginnings. And that, to me, represents an incredible beginning. Because all of a sudden you're saying something is not working in my life. So let's have a look and start again. Now. The story that linked to the purpose thing when Anth preached about it originally was that there was a guy called Nehemiah and he decides he's got to rebuild the wall. And he gets a group of people together, he says, we're going to rebuild this wall. 
and they get halfway through rebuilding the wall and that thing happens when you're halfway through a process and they get to feeling, you know, they start off all enthusiastic and halfway through the complaining kicks in. They're tired, it's not working, they're not seeing the progress fast enough, it's really weary, it's really, you know, they're complaining and all they can see is so much rubble and all they can hear is that others are not very happy with them. So it's like, well, it's messy and other people are upset about it. And that becomes their experience. Now, we heard about this at, at the time. They become very rubble-focused and very people-opinion-focused. But the irony is that the very, they've got half the rubble they had to begin with because half the wall is already built. So the rubble that they're using for the wall is the rubble that was the wall originally. So there's less rubble than when they started, but now all they see is the rubble. And there's something happens when we're part way into a process where that's when it's almost like, well, I'm trying and I'm still not full. I'm trying and it's still not working. And that's why you have to keep driving. Now, they had 52 days it took them in total. Don't you wish your stuff from empty to full only took you 52 days? I'd be up for that. Mine seems to take longer than that. Now, um, the, the last slide, then I'm going to start to bring it to a close and really give you a point of connection, I hope. I've read this there, I laughed so hard because I thought this is me. For a moment, he felt good about this. A moment or two later, he felt bad about feeling good about it. Then he felt good about feeling bad about feeling good about it and satisfied, drove off into the night. Now, oh, don't we tie ourselves in absolute knots about what all this stuff means and whether we're good enough and whether this and whether that and whether we're getting it right. And oh, it's absolutely exhausting. Um, now, for me, and that, what's happened already, with, particularly with Joel and Connie's song and with that uh, video that Beth showed, um, and the stuff from India, um, this, all I've been thinking about all day today is that line, and I couldn't find the Bible verse for it, but I know there's a song that says, It is well with my soul. And when I watched that guy on that video, you could see that he has been on a journey of, of having been so injured, I mean deep down at soul level, and then he has an encounter with a love that somehow mends his soul. I mean, call it your spirit, call it your, whatever that part name you want to give to that part of you that you know is just that deep down part of you. Um, I genuinely believe that there is an encounter that we can have and probably need to have daily of a wellness of soul. And I have had times when my soul has been well, and I have been times when my soul has not been well, and my circumstances have been identical on both occasions. Because when we lose that sense of wellness of soul, even if everything on the outside is okay, we're not okay. And when we have that wellness of soul, even when everything is not okay, we're okay. Now, I want, who, who identifies with that? Because to me, that is the message of the gospel, the good news. Um, let me just see where I am. It being well with your soul is not about an in or out thing. But I do think, I mean, you'll have heard phrases of the years about being born again and salvation and those things. And I don't think they're one-off things. And we've very much talked about it a lot here, that we need frequent beginnings because we can start off like this. And then it's very easy to lift the big things out of life and to top it up with sand. And all of a sudden you're thinking, yeah, I'm on, it's great. We're fine. You know, you've really got those, those, to me, those big rocks are about that deep down oneness with the Father. That thing that says somehow or other I am connected at soul level. Um, Chris has been speaking about blood covenant and the strength of that friendship. And don't we, I mean, it's Valentine's Day together tomorrow, isn't it? And don't people talk about soulmates? And, you know, it's my, they're my soulmate. And you think, what if... What if a way of seeing this blood covenant is you think it's something about a deepness of a, a friend in your soul, however you want to define that. And I know sometimes we can all get very lonely at that deep, 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 deep level. And I genuinely believe, just like that guy on the, in the video, that when we encounter um, a love at that level, that it somehow transforms it deep, deep down. 
So my challenge tonight is twofold, really. Um, if I start by sort of saying about us as a rock, as a rock church, we have very much been on a process of sort of having to be emptied. And what I respect and admire so much about Anthony and Chris is at the point where everything got emptied out, they didn't rush to fill it back up with more sand. And there was a time where all that was felt was emptiness and uncertainty about what to put back in. But we have now got some excellent rocks as a foundation that we are now building on and adding to. And those rocks, what's that song? The rock won't move. Um, those rocks are now in there and we are adding wonderful layers to that, which is incredibly exciting. But for some of you in your life, I just know you're at the point where you've kind of got to a life that feels for you like the sand. And you might not be able to articulate why, but something of what I'm saying tonight, just we all know what hits us and resonates with us, don't it? You kind of think, yeah, do you know what? I've filled my life up with stuff, but that stuff does not feel substantial. And there is a lack of a wellness in your soul deep down. Um, and that is where it needs to be. There needs to be a transformation, just like that guy on the video. Now, can I hand you a pill? Or, or say, there you go, there's a wellness of soul for you. No, but I do believe that there is a connection point that we can all have in any given moment that gets us back to that place of I and the Father are one that enables us to live that rich and substantial life, and that is incredibly important. Now, I would like to give you an opportunity to reflect on that and to consider that in your own life. Um, and I'd really quite like for you guys to sing that song again, but you I bet you're thinking, <laughs> Connie just went, no. <laughs> Yay! Um, I wish I could hand you it, and I wish I could always feel it myself, but I, I very much felt I needed to do this tonight, and I think, I just trust that some of you just know that's me. That's me, and I just challenge you to be willing to be empty and to actually get some of that soul stuff that, sense of you being well in your soul. Really believe for a moment of connection and really talk to us, talk to somebody. If you need to talk to somebody and say, look, I feel like I've become full of sand. There doesn't seem to be anything substantial that really connects me to my life. It's just about stuff rather than any depth or contrast or richness. Come and talk to us. We'd be glad to talk to you, we'd be glad to help. Um, and just believe for that transforming moment because the love that that man experienced when he found himself emptied and just his injuries, internal injuries laid bare, is available to you tonight. And I, I do believe that it works. I've, I've experienced it, I've lived it, and as have many people in here. So I think I'll move this because it won't quite work with your song. But while they sing it, I really felt when they were singing it that as they sing it again, I want us to stand, and I'll tell you why. Because some of you need to believe for a beginning tonight. That's your beginning, thinking, yeah, do you know what? I've lost my sense of who I am and where I fit in the story, my inner story in the midst of the stuff. And I think you need to stand and believe for a new beginning in your life. And if everybody else stands as well, we're standing with them, aren't we? We're saying we're gonna stand with you for a new beginning, we're gonna have a rich journey together, and all is well with our soul. Oh, doesn't that sound amazing? Right, okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's all right. They didn't match. They didn't match. It's fine. <laughs> we'll sort it after. I'm interested that that we'll should have just after. happened, right? Because even how, did anybody sense the panic then? Uh, the panic that something had broken. Oh, no, and now it's dropped all. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day. We're constantly being emptied out of things that we can, all of that can be re-put in and readjusted and cleaned and whatever. And I think that all of us need to get to a stage where we're just much more relaxed with life. Um, you know, I've realized even just from my week how stressed out we can get at so many things. And that's not saying that life isn't offering us experiences as opportunities to learn and to grow. 
But when we face them, we just need to breathe a little bit more and start to allow a little bit more fluidity. And I think it's amazing how, you know, when you approach situations, like what Jenny's been said from a more of a centered position, you really do start to hear things more clearly and you start to be more aware of what it is that you're feeling and what you're thinking. And I believe that that's where God really truly starts to speak when we just quiet our minds um, and really allow for this new beginning experience to happen. So, and I love the fact that Jenny's asked us to stand. I know some of you are probably thinking why. If you can sing along, then great. If you can't, it really doesn't matter. But I really do um, value you as people. I value this place doesn't necessarily mean we all agree with the same things. Uh, some of you might listen to some ministries and think, whoa, that's all a bit much for me. Um, or you might listen to them all and think that's great. But at the end of the day, it's about what we said earlier about this ecclesia, a group of people who come together to walk the journey. And I really want to believe that we can inspire each other continually. Uh, many years to come from now that we're still together and still uniting and celebrating together. So let this touch you once again. Standing out on a journey, never dreaming what we'd have to go through. Now here we are, and I'm suddenly standing at the beginning with you. No one told me I was going to find you. Unexpected, what you did to my heart. When Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are?
just hit the donate button now to help us help others.